Well, in 15 minutes to try and say something about shamanism and hallucinogens, we're just going to touch the surface. And I figure the simplest way to do this is just to sort of unload on you how I see these things. Um, Shamanism is not some obscure concern of cultural anthropologists. Shamanism is how religion was practiced for its first million years. Up until about 12,000 years ago, there was no other form of religion on this planet. That was how people attained some kind of access to the sacred. And uh, so shamanism then becomes uh, about technique. And if any of you are students of the literature of shamanism, you probably know that one of the great overviews of shamanism is contained in Merci Eliade's book, Shamanism, the Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy. The Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy. In other words, shamanism is not so much a religion as ordinarily conceived as it is a kind of uh, pre-rational science, a kind of methodology for attaining a certain kind of experience. And then the question becomes, what experience and what's so great about it? Well, the experience that is attained, if we can attempt to rise to some kind of cosmic overview so that we are not dealing with the experience in the context of what the Mazatecs say or the Witoto or some other tribal people. But when we attempt to pool all of this descriptive data, then what is the experience that the shaman is having that is making him or her an exemplar in their own society and in a sense almost superhuman. Well, if you analyze thousands and thousands of these shamanic experiences, both drug, both plant-induced and non-plant-induced, the uh, overwhelming connecting thread is boundary dissolution. This is what the experience is that we are all seeking, that we call terrifying, wonderful, desirable, horrible. But what it is, is it's the experience of having the roof fall in and the floor fall out all at once. Boundary dissolution. Why should that be so important, so wonderful? Because it acts psychologically in the human being uh, like a birth experience. The world is made new. Everything is seen through newly opened eyes. Now, there are many techniques of shamanism uh, for attaining this state. Uh, Celibacy, withholding food, ordeals, flagellation, mutilation. This doesn't sound like a program for a lot of fun, does it? <laughs> and then hallucinogenic plan. Now, it's a question which always emerges at these conferences. All of you people are talking about drugs and plant substances. Isn't there another way to do this? Isn't this what the great yogic systems, the great tantric systems of thought have opened up for us without the uh, self-polluting act of ingesting a plant into our bodies and polluting our precious bodily essences? The answer is no. No. And the further answer is the reason the universe is constructed this way is that so you will be forced to humble yourself into the admission that you can't do it alone. Why should you be able to do it alone? Where is it writ in adamantine that Joe Blow should be able to walk directly into the antechamber of the Most High simply because he or she wants to? Nowhere. The sine qua non 
fancy Latin for you can't get along without it. The sine qua non for attaining a psychedelic experience is humbling yourself to the point where you admit that you must submit to the experience of the plant or the drug. This act of surrender is the major technical uh, function you will be called upon to perform during the psychedelic trip. You just keep saying, take me, I'm yours, take me, I'm yours, and it will uh, do the rest. Well, this is much too much to get into in 15 minutes, but why the tension between boundary and boundary dissolution? Uh, Why the tension between the closed personal world of reinforced neurotic constructs that we call ordinary psychological health? Why the tension between that and this vastly expanded and open state of being where uh, life, Tao, seems to flow through us? Well, the tension between these states has to do, I think, with the fact that there is a blind spot in the human mind. We do not like to have called to our attention uh, the animate and caring nature of the universe because the universe is something that we have had to fight our way through to get to our present position. I mean, how many reindeer bit the dust that we could sit here this morning? Uh, How many forests were cleared You see, we have a long history of uh, resistance and conquest to nature. And when we experience the boundary-dissolving qualities of the hallucinogen, we learn what Pogo learned. We have met the enemy, and he is us. And closing that loop then creates a dimension of moral responsibility. And this is why the shaman is a special person, because the shaman has somehow closed the loop of moral responsibility and in so doing becomes tremendously authentic to the people uh, in the society that is constellated around the shaman. The shaman basically uh, is an exemplar a model for how to be, not simply how to be in the psychedelic or the trance state, but how to be in the act of wooing, how to be in the act of hunting, child rearing, so forth. It's a kind of exemplar that bursts through cultural conditioning. Cultural conditioning is like bad software. It's over and over it's diddled with and rewritten so that it can just run on the next attempt. But there is cultural hardware and it's that cultural hardware otherwise known as authentic being that we are propelled toward by the example of the shaman and the techniques of the shaman. You know, if if someone tells you that uh, vast spiritual riches await you, if you will, but give up sex, interesting food, and your own thoughts for 10 or 15 years, and follow along with them, then something will be attained. This is no challenge to most of us, because we have our lives to lead, mortgages to pay, children to feed, car payments. But if someone tells you, eat this plant, and you will come into your birthright, that's a real existential challenge. The excuse that it's difficult or unattainable has been removed. There can no longer be shilly-shallying around that issue. Shamanism, therefore, is a call to authenticity. Well, then the last point that I want to make, this authenticity is generally presented and has generally been presented throughout the evolution of the psychedelic movement in the United States as a kind of personal integrity, a kind of 
psychological health as though you had confronted all your demons and slain them and you are now balanced or individuated or whole or something like that. That's true. That is the first stage of the shamanic integration. But that is not the goal of the shamanic integration. Otherwise, it just becomes a kind of chemical, uh, uh, chemically assisted psychotherapy. The goal is then having attained that balance, that wisdom, that, uh, that connection, to then rise up to a level of universal meaning. In other words, to break through the machinery of cultural conditioning in the same way that the shaman does and to attempt to uh, discover something authentic, something authentic outside the self-generated language cloud. And to my mind, what this authentic thing is, is... It's hard to know how to put it, but it's the animate quality that resides within the psychedelic experience, that the, the universal mind is alive, is sentient, is perceiving, is there to meet you when you come through from the other side. So we're not talking about psychedelics as a spotlight to be turned on to reveal the detritus of our own personal unconscious. It is not a spotlight. It is not shining from behind you. It is shining ahead of you. It is actually that the same organizational principles which called us forth into self-reflection have called forth self-reflection out of the planet itself. And the problem then is for us to suspect this act on our suspicion and be good detectives and track down the spirit in its lair. And this is what shamans are doing. They are hunters of spirit. Now, anthropology tends to want to... Well, place in a museum diorama is too harsh a phrase. (laughs) But wants to freeze these things in context so they become artifacts. So then we say, well, how do the Witoto think about the shaman? And I've even seen papers. What do the Witoto think of the shaman in winter? What do the Witoto think of the shaman in summer? Well, not only is this a stupid question on the face of it, but since they don't have winter and summer, it's a stupid question beneath the surface. Shamanism does not exist in the same way that other culture-bound institutions exist for us to catalog and reflect on. Rather, this is a case where we played the role of the prodigal son, the descent into physis, the descent into matter. For 15,000 years, we have wandered to a desert, and we are now very well adapted to the desert's of rationalism, materialism, state politics, patriarchy, so forth and so on. But there is no food in a desert. (laughs) Eventually, there has to be a promised land. And I believe that many people in this room know that personally, that promised land is the psychedelic experience. The larger challenge and it is a larger challenge, it's easy to fix your own mind, the larger challenge is to somehow make this private doorway a public option, empower ourselves to speak of this in such a way that it cannot be put down, it cannot be rolled over, it cannot be pigeonholed, It cannot be handed over to a clique of experts, but rather it has to be confronted as the authentic thing which we lost so long ago that we no longer have any image of the thing lost. 
We simply have an ache, an ache that cannot be gotten rid of. The, the solution to this is a re-empowering of the shamanic meme, a taking of the idea of shamanism, pouring it into the best our own self-exploration has given to us, which to my mind means art, psychotherapy, and uh, art, and uh, <laughs> to try to empower these institutions to give back our authenticity that was lost. The cultures that possess shamanism function the entire culture as a shamanic model for those of us who wander in the prodigal's desert of materialism. And through the work of people like Gordon Wasson and Richard Evans Schultes and in the 19th century Richard Spruce, the tools have been catalogued, the magical plants. And I don't believe that shamanism without hallucinogens is authentic shamanism or comfortable shamanism. Now, this is a great debate in anthropology. Merciliad on one side saying, when shamanism turns to narcotics, it has entered a decadent and final phase. The very use of the word narcotics betrays such a botanical naivete <laughs> that you know you're not going to be happy which, with what follows. <laughs> Watson, on the other hand, said, a shamanism that does not resort to hallucinogenic plants is a shamanism that has lost its roots. A shamanism that relies on ordeals, pathological personalities, and withholding of food is a shamanism that has lost a sense of its techniques and its efficacy. So uh, the last thought I would like to leave with you is... Uh, and I hope I'm preaching to the converted, but if there's a single person in this room who doesn't know what I'm about to say, then it's worth repeating. And that is, we are not bullshitting you. This is not yoga. This is not NLP, not to knock those things. This is real. It is so real that you can take the most hardened, rational, reductionist asshole and <laughs> drop him in to that environment, and he will meet his maker. You know? It, it dissolves you. It dissolves you into a confrontation with authentic being. And this is what we are starving for. This is how we've gotten into the messes and mess that we're in. Take seriously the techniques of shamanism. Study the plants. Make real choices. And then don't diddle the dose. Once you've done your homework, <laughs> go for it. You're listening to The Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. Don't diddle the dose. <laughs> There's really not much you can add to that truism. Uh, Jonathan Ott's way of saying that is, beware the dreaded underdose. And while those statements may seem funny on the surface, uh, if you have a lot of experience with these sacred medicines, you know how serious those two statements really are. You know, uh, whenever I think of Terence and Jonathan Ott at the same time, one other character also comes to mind, and that's Christian Rush, uh, who you can hear in podcasts number 10 and number 12 here in the Psychedelic Salon. They each had their special areas of expertise, and Christian's is shamanism. In my humble opinion, Christian is, uh, without any doubt, the world's current leading researcher, teacher, and thinker about shamanism. I remember one night in Palenque when uh, a bunch of us were sitting on someone's porch talking long into the night, and uh, somebody asked Christian how many great shamans he had met in his life, and uh, his reply really took us all by surprise. He said, uh, if I remember correctly, 
that he had only known two people who he would call fully realized shamans. And uh, then he went on to define what he meant by that. Uh, now, I may have this wrong, and perhaps someone who talks with Christian at a conference someday can ask that question again and let us know what he has to say. But uh, no matter what the specifics are, I'm positive that he thought that such people are very rare indeed. Now, the person you're about to hear from right now, Matt Palomary, has uh, sometimes been mistakenly called an urban shaman. And uh, even by me, I must admit, and I'm sorry for that, Mateo. But he is always uh, very quick to set the record straight. Matt, uh, or Mateo, as his friends often call him, is a longtime student of shamanism, but he is not a shaman. I uh, personally believe, however, uh, even though he hasn't been calling himself a healer or a kuandero, I, uh, I personally believe that he's certainly on that level today. Now, you've heard from Mateo before in podcast number 80 and 89, but today I'll be uh, talking with him about his new book, a very rich and personal memoir titled Spirit Matters. Several months ago, uh, I read it in manuscript form, and I'm currently rereading it now uh, that the book is actually in print. And I'm here to tell you that it reads like a hair-raising novel. Matt's life has truly been an adventure. And for anyone who is trying to bootstrap himself or herself up from a difficult childhood, well, Mateo's story can be a true inspiration because it shows that, uh, without a doubt, spirit truly does matter. In fact, uh, it may ultimately be the only thing that matters. So please join Matt Palmieri and me as we have a little chat here in the Psychedelic Salon. So here we are uh, in a beautiful sunny day in Southern California, uh, overlooking the Pacific Ocean, sitting here in the Psychedelic Salon after having survived a few more adventures in the mountains. And uh, I'm here to talk with my dear friend, uh, Matteo, Matt Palomari, about his new book, Spirit Matters. And what uh, I find really unique about this book is that, you know, you've been writing for, I guess, probably 25 years or more and teaching writing and as far as I know, this is your uh, first, well, it's the first nonfiction work I've read that you've done, and you've probably done other nonfiction, but this is the, the first one. It's a, a memoir. Uh, so what what uh, what prompted that decision? How did you get to, <laughs> from uh, Land Without Evil, which I think is one of the most brilliant uh, novels about shamanism I've read, uh, into uh, a reality-based uh, mode? Well, thank you. Um, and I didn't pay him to say those things. I really appreciate that. Um, I began, I've been researching shamanism all my life. Um, I was into lots of things uh, when I was younger. And then I read uh, Carlos Castaneda books when I was uh, 18, which made a big impression. And I began researching shamanism. And uh, I went through a phase in my life where I did lots of... Uh, Altered States research as a very young man. I won't get into all that because it's in the book. But I was researching and researching and I took off, uh, I finally got to the point where I took 13 years of my life off and didn't do anything at all. I wouldn't take aspirin if I had a headache, uh, coffee, nothing. Uh, and I was a vegetarian for 23 years. And through all my research, um, I got connected to uh, gentleman by the name of Terence McKenna, who really opened my eyes to some things about the plants. So um, I was writing novels. I've written, I think, nine novels, uh, published two of them. And I was writing a novel about uh, shape-shifting. And I was researching the uh, lycanthropy mythos. And lycanthropy, for those of you who don't know, is basically the werewolf mythos, which gets into shape-shifting. And I discovered through my research at... Uh, university libraries that um, there's a lot of shape-shifting, uh, particularly in South America, tied in with uh, visionary plants. So I did some extensive research on visionary plants, and I wrote a novel about uh, a guy who became a shape-shifter, and I almost got it published, but uh, didn't happen for whatever reasons. But I was really drawn into um, the plants and the things that they could bring. So I first read about ayahuasca, uh, I believe it was 1990, and I knew quite a bit about it 
because I read everything I could get on it at the time, which wasn't very much. Uh, this was at University Library, uh, UC California, actually. And um, I was on a mission to find it. And it took me just about 10 years. And um, I found it. So I got uh, myself somehow invited to spend time with a shaman from Peru and uh, got to experience it firsthand. And it really changed my life incredibly. And so I started to pursue it more and more and more. And at this point in time, I've been working with it uh, for nine years. I've been to the jungle like 10 times doing extended uh, plant diets. And there was a period there a few years back where I was doing it roughly 30 times a year. And what was happening was, as my life was unfolding and developing and, and going down this path, is that my life started getting weirder than anything that I could write about. And then I suddenly realized that, that wasn't so sudden, I guess, but my life was weirder than anything I could think up and imagine. And I also figured out that a lot of the things in my life that I thought were like normal, like I thought everybody grows up like this, I found out it was actually quite unusual. So... Um, I got pushed by a lot of people to really record my experiences and through all that um, things evolved and uh, the book came out of it um, and it's been really wonderful so far it's doing very good well you know I can uh, attest to the fact that uh, your life is quite unusual in fact uh, of course I read the manuscript a number of months ago and I'm on my second read of the book now and uh to be honest, uh, you know, I'm, I'm amazed that you're both alive and not in jail, quite frankly. I mean, it starts out with you growing up uh, in a concrete Irish Catholic ghetto. And, uh, uh, you know, some of the experiences were, to me, just totally horrific. Because I, I grew up in sort of a Ozzie and Harriet uh, kind of environment and uh, didn't grow up on the street. And uh, I, I, uh, I hope that some of the... Uh, some of our friends here in the salon, particularly uh, young people who might be having a, a difficult time of it, whether they're uh, in an inner city situation or in, uh, in a deeply uh, conservative religious family or whatever, uh, you know, a lot of you know, we all have our own difficulties going through through life. But uh, I think there's uh, a lot of inspiration here uh, for people to. To see that you know, spirit really does matter. As the t I don't think we've mentioned the title of the book is "Spirit Matters," and uh, you know, for somebody who can can go from being a small child and have his father try to burn the house down around him, and still be somewhat uh, sane, and uh, I use that word loosely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's an amazing amazing story. Actually, it, it reads uh, it's a page turner. Uh, if I didn't know it was nonfiction, I would think it's one of your better novels. So uh, it, it's got to have been pretty painful. Though. How, did, how did going through all those old memories affect you? It was fascinating because part of the journey with ayahuasca and plants is um, figuring out who you are and why are you here. So as part of my process, um, working and going through my life, it was, it was fascinating because I remembered things a certain way. And then you recall the memory, and then you suddenly realize that you really find out kind of uh, full of shit. Because, you know, you, you have a memory, you get in a fight when you're 16, and you think, oh, I took on a gang of 20 guys or something. And you realize, well, gosh, you know, now you're an adult. Well, okay, it wasn't, it was really two guys, not 20. You know, you, as a kid, you tend to exaggerate and um, blow things out of proportion. So you made me think of a couple of things when you were asking this question and when you were talking. Um, one of the things I want to mention is that um, I make a joke with my wife, you know, why do you do this and why do you do that? And if I perform, like I, I drum and sing. And I always say, it's all for you, baby. So um, this is all for you, you guys out there, you guys and gals. And um, I mean a few things by that. One of the things I mean is that... Um, I've gone through some really dark places and I've done that so um, other people won't have to do that. And um, people were telling me for the first few years I was going to the jungle, you're going there for us, you're going there for us and I didn't quite get it. But now I got it. 
So one of the underlying themes of spirit matters is that it's a map and it's a guide. And I'm way out on point. Uh, the whole thing about am I sane or not, you know, that's right. It depends <laughs> on who you ask. But um, I'm on point. And I've had a lot of experiences and some very hard things I've gone through. And people tend to live vicariously through me. And I'm hoping that everyone who reads the book can live vicariously through me and avoid, I guess, actually probably literally avoid the bullets at some a few points uh, so they won't have to go through it. So, uh, you know, altered states of consciousness are fascinating and they're part of life and they're part of experience. And if they're here for a reason. So there are some substances which, um, in my humble opinion, are not good for you. You know, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing here, but, you know, crystal meth, crack cocaine, heroin, I mean, obviously, don't get you to a good place. Uh, you take something like LSD or mushrooms or ayahuasca, and if you take those with the proper respect and you um, put a good intention behind them, they're really wonderful tools. They're uh, psycho-spiritual tools. When I go to the jungle, I tell people I'm going to church and I'm going to listen to mom because mom's going to give me some lessons. So um, anything has the potential for abuse. And one of the important things about doing these medicines, particularly ayahuasca, and I'm rephrasing this, uh, repeating myself, but is the intention that you put behind it. So um, I've learned these things and I've gone through these passages and uh, I'd like to think that what's taking me 50 plus years to learn and barely make, somebody who may be in their 20s can read it and go, okay, I, I got the memo. So they can avoid all that and then they can jump ahead much quicker. So somebody could be, for argument's sake, they could be 24 and maybe be close to where I am in their advancement uh, and not have to do all the things that I've done. That's a really good point. That, uh, and of course, that's one of the reasons we, we read and listen to stories so that we don't have to uh, go through some of these things. Uh, I know some of the stories, uh, and I don't know if everybody in the salon knows this, but I used to be a lawyer. Uh, well, I guess I still am. I still have my license to lie, uh, <laughs> at least in the state of Texas. But uh, the uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, talk about basically illegal activities. And I'm not talking about just taking some sacred medicines. I'm talking about uh, hardcore uh, criminal activity <laughs> before uh, they force you into the service. And I don't want to give away too much of the book because uh, it is a, an exciting read and a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, every page uh, uh, has an adventure on it. I, I know that when I got about midway through the book, uh, there was a little breathing point in your life. And I thought, oh, boy, I can really relax a little bit. The tension was building up. And I realized you're only about 28 years old at that point. And I thought, oh, no, i got a lot more to go. So, uh, but, you know, all of this, uh, this, the stories, you've been very frank, very open about it. And uh, being a lawyer, I'm, I'm well aware that all the statutes of limitations have passed. So you're not uh, exposing yourself to anything there. But uh, what do you think about uh, perhaps uh, people that might pick this up uh, and uh, see, you know, where you come from and, and maybe discount the whole story just because uh, it was a pretty rough beginning for you? Well, for one thing, it's their loss. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. But, you know, it's, it's good you made me think of something else and part of this whole process, um, particularly working with ayahuasca. There's a, um, a term that Carl Jung um, coined is called individuation and essentially we are uh, a cast of thousands um, whether it's you know okay I'm hungry I'm horny I'm pissed I'm going to kill you I love you it's all these different aspects of ourselves and when you get into psychological things and traumas uh, we tend to get somewhat splintered the worst extreme cases um, are multiple personalities which are pretty much I think 100% all brought about by molestation. Um, and what happens at a young age when you get go through a horrible experience like that... Now, you're talking about in addition to just like, not just sexual molestation, but mental... Uh, I, I think they're all sexual. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, all the cases I've studied have been. Mm. There may be other cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, you know, you, you know, you can get in off into schizophrenia and right. all kinds of weird things. But, but primarily, um, multiple personality, which has always fascinated me, um, always gets into... Um, a, a molestation thing and what happens is that the personality 
um, is under such uh, traumatic stress that it basically breaks and reforms into something new in order to deal with it because it can't deal with it. So when you go through this process, if you continue at it, um, you begin to look for the lost parts of yourself and basically bring them home. And the more you bring them home, uh, the more whole you become. And the more whole you become, the more aware you become, and the more you are in the moment, and the more you can deal with things. So I've been really stepping up the pace with this thing and this process. And one of the things I've learned, I have a very wonderful, wonderful personal coach who's working with me, and um, I work with her and with the medicines and working together with them. And she uh, calls things secrets. We all have our secrets. Um, and we all have our shadows, which ties in with the... Uh, which Ann Shul- Shulgin talks about quite a bit, too. Yes, in fact, in Shulgin, yeah, she inspired me quite a bit, and she um, has some responsibility for me writing this book because she encouraged me to write about some of my experiences. Mm. So um, in this shadow work, in the secrets, um, so to speak, if you're an asshole, you don't know it. And I hope that's okay to see on the podcast. But the <laughs> FCC is not here, right? <laughs> You don't know it. You don't realize it. Because what you do when you're being that is you project it onto everybody outside of you. And you make them it so you don't have to look at yourself. So the key is to find your secrets and to reveal them so you can deal with them properly. Um, I've been, I, I consider myself to be blessed because I was never molested or any of that weird sexual shit, thank God. Um, but anybody who has, and it's, it's, it's happened to... Um, other members of my family. Um, when you're a kid and you're molested and that, and something horrible like that happens, you're helpless. And then you get all the shame and the guilt and the judgments from society that goes with it, which are really a load of crap because you were helpless and you're innocent. So people need to realize that, you know, on one level it's not their fault and it's really nothing to be ashamed of. The thing is to do is to realize it, face it and deal with it and move on with it. So the process of writing the book was part of that process of um, rediscovering myself or selves, bringing all my selves with a small S home, with the self with a capital S being in charge, being, you know, daddy's home, basically, and taking charge. And one of the fascinating things that happened to me primarily with the ayahuasca is that my feminine side was non-existent. I am, and Lorenzo can attest to this, I'm the original hard ass. And I went through 30 years of my life never crying. And it wasn't like, I'm not going to cry. There was just nothing there. And um, when I started working with the ayahuasca, uh, my femininity, my repressed femininity, which is what's wrong with our society, by the way, uh, started coming to the surface. And I had a couple of years where one thing or another just sent me bawling. Like, you know, I had a really incredible moment. Um, my mother called me one morning for my birthday, and she calls me. I pick up the phone, and she goes, oh, by the way, my mom was very cool. And she calls me, and she says, happy birthday, honey. And I just started bawling. You know, I'm blubbering. I'm like, Woo! and she's like, oh, honey, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I'm like, Woo! and she's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I'm going, Woo! and she goes, is this those plants and stuff you're working with in the jungle? <laughs> and I go, yeah. She goes, okay, honey, you know, have a good cry, you know. And I got through it. So I went through this for a couple of years, and an amazing thing happened. Um, my intuition started really rising up. So, so my point here is that when I started integrating my repressed femininity and bringing it home, because it was basically abandoned and sent out to lunch or to another planet or whatever, when I started integrating it in myself, that part of me, the intuitive side of me, really, really started to rise up. And um, now it's been getting to the point where there's been a lot of uh, telepathic experiences um, and other things. So no matter where you've been in your life, no matter what you've done, um, there's nothing to be ashamed of. And some people were uncomfortable by what I've written. And it comes down to this. I'm not ashamed of where I came from. I'm not ashamed of who I've been or where I've been. I've learned. And the most important thing is what am I now? And what am I, excuse me, what am I becoming? Good point. Yeah. Good point. You know, as you're you're laying this out just now, I, I remembered our, our spiritual mentor who uh, a year or so ago told me, he said, well, you can't change the past, but you can change the way you think about it. But in your case, 
thinking about it actually changed the past because instead of 20 guys, there were two guys. And so the, for you, the past really has changed. And the other thing that came to mind that you were, as you were talking was uh, what one of our friends uh, recently just channeled this song from his uh, deceased brother where he said, be the one you want to be with, be the one they want to be with. You know, So it's uh, you, you have certainly uh, uh, made a lot of strides because uh, I can guarantee after reading your book, the... Uh, about the first 35 years of your life, you weren't the one I want to be. <laughs> Neither did a lot of other people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you said in, in 1990 you started really getting serious about trying to get a hold of all the information about ayahuasca that you could uh, find. And, uh, you know, it's it's uh, the more you learn about it, the more intimidating it gets, uh, at least from my standpoint, uh, and uh, and even in my case, the more experience I have, I know at the end of last week, as we were beginning our uh, final ceremony, uh, well, it was all I could do to uh, <laughs> go up front and take a sip of the tea, and and uh, you know, I was saying to myself, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And and uh, in fact, I realized that that possibly uh, one of the main reasons I've been sick for the six weeks going into it is I was looking for an excuse to get out. I was trying to find a way to not go and, and so I went sick and now I've, I'm, I'm feeling better than I've ever felt for uh, at least for many, many years. So, you know, what, what uh, I can't answer the question for myself, but uh, what, uh, can you answer that question? What made you go to the jungle to drink this, this strange brew in the first place? And more importantly, what, what keeps you going back? Well... One of my mottos throughout my life has been, um, I want to try everything at least once. Uh, but I have to modify that because there's some things I don't want to try. Um, I don't want to try getting gang raped. <laughs> no, that's not, that's okay. I, I, somebody else can deal with that. That's not for me. But um, on this path, and this path is not for everybody. And that's why one of the reasons I say I go for other people and I, I do it for you. Um, one of the things about it is that you go through different levels in the teaching. Now, I think I've said this before on the podcast, but certain substances, for argument's sake, uh, and this is my humble opinion, um, takes things like, say, MDMA and LSD. In my humble opinion, they don't have any consciousness inherent in them. Uh, they're amplifiers. Uh, LSD amplifies lots of things inside of you and amplifies your perceptions. MDMA is what they call an empathogen, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, it can be emotional and, you know, heart opening, but they don't have an inherent intelligence. Ayahuasca and mushrooms do, and there is a method to the madness. And it's been a common experience um, to see things happening. When I'm getting within a few days of doing some ayahuasca work, things start happening that are a bit out of the ordinary um, in my life. So... They, um, I've gone through different levels where there were, there, there's a um, landscape. There is a, there's a DMT landscape, um, which I've spent a lot of time traveling in. And, um, you know, there's like the crystal castles and other things that are inherent in it. So I found that as I've gone through different levels where I can get to a point where I don't seem like everything it seems like I've seen it all and things aren't going to really change and well okay maybe I won't do this anymore but then I wait because uh, I see it and then all of a sudden I shift to a whole new level and it starts teaching me something on another level and it, it takes you through um, different tests the things to see if you're ready for certain things and then I can go through an experience and then suddenly uh, that experience will connect with an experience I had five years ago and it'll make sense and it gets into the thing about um Time travel is what I call it now. Because think about this. If I remembered being in a gang fight, it was two guys, and I said it was 20. Well, that's the uh, content of that experience. Content, that's what is within it. But when I'm further up the road and I go back on it, I'm looking at it in context, which is the bigger picture. So when I realized that I was in an argument, I got in an argument with this guy and I got in a fight, right? And you know, he was an idiot. Um... And then I find out 20 years later that I was an idiot too, right? And that's why I ended up in a fight in the first place. Then I think, oh gosh, it's not. I, I was responsible for part of that. I have to take responsibility for my part in it. 
So then the whole experience changes because what I thought of as the past changes and I realized that, well, guess what? There were two assholes there instead of one, right? So I've changed the past, which changes me now. Um, you know, that's what we do. So it's been this uh, progression of teaching and learning and, and learning how to heal uh, myself and others. Uh, one of the definitions of shamanism, I think there's even a book with the title, is shamans are called uh, the wounded healers. And you learn to heal others by learning to heal yourself. So some of the hellish experiences I've gone through, I've had people come to me for a healing and they're going through the exact same experience and I'm totally with them because I know. And it gives me the ability to, to heal them because I understand the dynamics because it's a path I've already passed over. So um, the jungle is really, truly, it's just an amazing place to submerse yourself in nature. You know, no cell phones, no electricity, no, no uh, electromagnetic pollution in the air. And you're just surrounded by nature, trees and plants and, you know, birds and animals and jaguars and, you know, lions and tigers and bears. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> not really in the jungle down there, but, you know. And aren't you pretty much isolated the whole time? It's in the, yes. very solitary during the day? Yes. Uh, the main group I've gone down with for nine years uh, goes to a camp that's in virgin jungle that the shaman has. And it's a... Um, Okay, it's a tributary of a tributary of a tributary of the Amazon. Uh, might even be one more tributary there. But anyway, uh, we stay on our own open hair huts called Tombos. And um, you spend most of the time there alone. And they bring you your food twice a day. And I think I've talked about this before. It's a very mm-hmm. restricted diet, so I won't get into those details. Uh, I'll listen to uh, the other podcast, whatever it is. You'll find me on there on, on Matrix Masters. Um, but you spend most of the time alone, and, and for me, I'm a bit of an extremist, so all the whole line of the tombos I have, it's mine, it's reserved, it's mine, I have the very last one. So um, there's, no, there's nothing but jungle on the other side of me, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So you spend most of the time alone there, and then you meet roughly every other night for uh, an ayahuasca session, and you work with other plants. But you spend your time alone, just surrounded by all the noise, and the jungle's noisy. Very noisy. Um, there's animals and bugs, and you know I've had a jaguar a few times uh, down below my tambo. I got them on tape. Um, it's a very very noisy place, but you get into it. And you see, in, in shamanism, in life, everything is energy. So if you're around a bunch of cell phones and automobiles and all this stuff, there's all this unnatural energy that's in the air. And then even to the point of the energy of sort of even, you know, for lack of better words, physical pollution like air pollution and water pollution and all that. You go to the jungle and you go on a cleansing diet and you immerse yourself into the vibration of nature, which is the vibration of Mother Earth, which is very pure. And you're by yourself. And if you have issues, if you're being an idiot, um, you can't project it on anybody but yourself. <laughs> so you're forced to be with yourself. And uh, you can't run and you can't hide. You know, you got to deal with it. So um, it's it's always been for me very very energizing. And each time, uh, Lorenzo, you remember the, the very first time I went, um, our facilitator looked at Lorenzo and kind of gave him a funny smile and basically said, uh, "Say goodbye to Matt because he ain't coming back." <laughs> you know, and sure enough, kind of I came back, Mateo, and uh, yep. you know, it's ongoing. You know that. Uh, while we're talking about the experience in the jungle, and, and we did cover this in uh, in a couple other podcasts, uh, but uh, just a, a brief word uh, because you we, we use the word diet I think in two different ways. There's the diet in preparation for the experience, and then you've been using the word plant diet. And uh, uh, just so that uh, those who are just joining us for uh, one of the first times here in the salon know that when you go to the jungle experience, there's uh, essentially five nights of ayahuasca and the every other night and the alternative days you use different plants you want to just say a little bit about that that's what you i assume are calling the plant diet yeah in in, uh, the diet in spanish it's the dieta and uh, the jungle in spanish in peru is la selva so it's the dieta and la selva and it's a diet um in many ways because the fact that you're removing yourself from civilization and commerce is one level of dieting 
And then I'll just touch on the diet briefly here. Um, it's it's basically okay. No soap, no shampoo, no scents of any kind, no mosquito repellent, nothing. And then you basically get um, oatmeal, quinoa, which is a protein-rich grain that the Incas used from Peru, rice, uh, plantanos, which are baked or boiled bananas that taste like cardboard and get gag trying to get them down. Um, there's no salt, there's no fruit, there's no vegetables. And then every two or three days you get a piece of chicken or fish. Now all the grains are prepared just with water. And the, the chicken and the fish is basically just cooked on fire. And that's it. And no salt, you know, for 10 days. And then you, there's a plant called Wayusa, which is very sweet. Uh, the closest I could describe it is eucalyptus, but it's not eucalyptus. And every morning they bring you the crushed leaves of that. And you take a plant bath. And then you're taking all these grains and stuff. And you're drinking these uh, plants concoctions. And you're cleaning yourself out on all levels. And the jungle is tropical, it's humid, so you're sweating. So um, you do all these things and they bring the food to you. And then in conjunction with the ayahuasca, you'll get another plant that you drink every day. So you'll get basically, a, um, it's like a half gallon pitcher of uh, a particular plant that you're working with. And these plants all work with the ayahuasca. Uh, they say ayahuasca is the mother of the plants. And then these other plants, and, in, and you know, in the uh, Peruvian shamanic tradition, these plants, each one is a spirit. And these are the spirits of the jungle. So you take this same plant every day, every day, every day, and then you take ayahuasca every other day. And it brings you um, through psychological and physical challenges. Um, sometimes they're not as challenging. Sometimes they're really hard. But you go through these um, ordeals. And during this time you're there which is basically 10 days there are longer ones but 10 days is really long <laughs> enough <laughs> enough um, but you go through these experiences and what happens is your whole cycle of life gets turned on its head you can be up all night and sleep all day and the boundaries between waking and dreaming blur and you have amazing dreams um you know, I've had dreams that were more real than real. Uh, I won't get into it. you got to buy the book for that. <laughs> um, but you change through this whole psychological thing, and you're immersed in the jungle, in this dieta. So the dieta is keeping you to yourself away from everything else in order to uh, go through a period of self-exploration or physical. Some of them are just for strengthening the body, um, different parts of the body. Some of them for different uh, psycho-spiritual experiences. And you do it for 10 days. And then at the end of the 10 days, um, the first thing you do is, is you take a pinch of salt. And they call that pinch of salt the gateway back to this reality. Um, interestingly enough, I'll give a plug for the uh, antigen review here. Um, I was doing, you know, doing these, these, these dietas now, like I say, for nine years. And um, I read a wonderful article some years back in the antigen review. And they talked about a study that they did with rats. And they deprived them of salt for a period of time, and then they gave them salt, and it stimulated neuronal growth in the brain. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a known fact that ayahuasca basically rewires your brain. So if you think about these indigenous people that go back since before dirt, I mean millennia, it's prehistoric, right? And somehow they figured out the knowledge of doing these plant diets and working on yourself with, with plants like ayahuasca and then taking it and, and really sort of kicking it into second gear and enhancing it with the, the whole salt part of it. Um, it's fascinating when you think about it because the neurochemistry these guys know is just mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. So um, it's really something that I feel incredibly, incredibly blessed and privileged to be able to experience. Um, blessed to be to be part of that. And... Uh, Blessed to learn this knowledge that is really disappearing, um, you know, with all the uh, the rape of Mother Earth, for lack of better words, the abuse. Um, these wonderful plant spirits who have done so much for me. And the other thing I want to mention briefly is that um, when you do these different plants, these spirits, and you take them into your body for that period of time, and you work with them for all that time, they're always with you forever after that. And you can sometimes call on them when when the um, Shaman, the ayahuasquero, uh, singing the Icaros, he's singing to the spirits of the plants and the animals. 
and you can call in their energies to come and help you in healing. You, uh, you, you, you flatter them. Hmm. There's an expression called uh, whistling through the forest. And, you know, somebody who's unaware can walk into the jungle and just see a bunch of plants. And, and on one level, they all look the same, you know. Um, but there are spirits and forces that are hidden there. And they can uh, kill you. Some are very deadly. They can harm you. They can heal you. And when you go into the jungle and you do this thing of called su- sort of uh, whistling through the forest, you're basically saying, I know you're there. I respect you. And I'm asking you, you know, if you can help me. So basically, when you sing to them, you're flattering them. Mm. You know, oh, you beautiful babe. You know, if you if, if you see a, a a babe, you know, if you're a guy, I'll just go say a guy for the example. It, it applies across the board, uh, no matter what your sexual orientation is or whatever. But let's say you, you see a girl and you, hey, you're a sweetheart, and I'm going to bring you flowers and perfume and chocolate, right? Well, you're singing to these plants and these spirits and telling them how beautiful they are and how much you honor and respect them. And part of you is also saying, you know. Please don't hurt me too much. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, you flatter them and ask them to come when you sing to them. And they come and deliver and, and uh, do healing and uh, open you up in lots of really wonderful and magical ways. Well, before we, we close, and I want to uh, make sure everybody knows how to find you and get a copy of, of your book, which I think is uh, very inspirational myself. Uh, one last question. I'd like to see if we can make a little distinction uh, between a, a couple words, uh, uh, Kundero, healer, ayahuascaro, and shaman. I know you go out of your way to make sure that people don't call you a shaman. You're a student of shamanism. And there's a fine distinction between some of those, but if you maybe just touch on that a little bit, I think it'd be good. Sure. Um, well, a curandero is a healer. And, and you know, the, it's in Spanish, the cur, C-U-R, um, says it's a person who cures. And if they're feminine, it's curandera. Um, also, in, in more sort of, you know, Mexican Spanish is brujo and bruja, but that's more sort of inclined toward uh, calling them sorcerers. And sorcerer doesn't always have a uh, negative connotation as people put on it. Um, and ayahuasquero is a person who specifically works with ayahuasca. Um, I worked with some amazing people down there who weren't ayahuasqueros, but who were um, coranderos. And they would say, one of them is really old timer, he was amazing. And Guillermo says, I am a plant man. My father was a plant man. My father's father was a plant man, and I basically come from a long line of plant men. Um, I like to say that ultimately, if people were, were waking up, that everybody's a shaman. But a shaman could be, uh, a shaman could do healing without even using any plants or substances, possibly. Uh, American Indian shamans used lots of different plants and things, but they were different. But it doesn't matter because you're using the spirits of nature to work with. Um, healers can be different things. Healers can be, uh, you know, a um, massage therapist and a chiropractor or a healer. It doesn't necessarily make them a shaman, although they could be applying shamanic techniques. But I've worked with some uh, Shipibo Indians who were um, ayahuasqueros who were really experts at massage. So, you know, they're, they're curandera ayahuasca healers. Hmm. Um, but, you know, there are distinctions. I mean, some regular medical doctors can be healers, although some of them I wonder about. Um, so, you know, it's, it's it, I think it has to do with the energies that you work with in order to bring about the healing. And for me, in my experience and what I've learned, uh, shamans are people who are masters of energy. And part of our purpose here on this planet is to learn how to handle energy in the proper way so that we can become responsible cosmic citizens because we're dealing with great, tremendous power. And if you're not impeccable and you don't know what you're doing, you're playing with more than fire. So uh, I hope that's a good answer for... Well, yeah, and I didn't didn't plan it this way, but uh, basically what you're saying in the end is spirit really does matter. Damn straight. And uh, the title of your memoir, of course, is Spirit Matters, and... There'll be links uh, with the program notes for this uh, for people to be able to, to find it and find you, but uh, let's eliminate the middleman. How can they find you directly? Uh, for one thing, it's uh, it's available everywhere, but um, uh, my publisher is Mystic Inc. Publishing. M-Y-S-T-I-C-I-N-K P-U-B-L-I-S-H-I-N-G dot com. Mystic Inc. Publishing dot com. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is mattpalamary.com, M-A-T-T, P as in Paul, A-L-L-A-M as in Mary, A-R-Y. 
I have uh, a section there on shamanism with some pictures and some essays and some things. And um, I get the biggest hits there. And I think it's because the uh, the podcasts I'm doing and people who are really interested in um, these ancient healing ways. But well, Kasuak, I appreciate you saying that. And for those of you who are wondering why I'm calling him Kasuak, you need to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find out. Thanks a lot for stopping by and uh, be well, my brother. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Spirit really does matter.